So to get started, uh, we're, uh, if you want to go to the breakout sessions page on the main agenda, there's a link to our training materials. And the, the, these materials are going to be online pretty much forever, as long as Google Slides exists. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not. <laughs> Um, so, so today what we're going to be talking about is participatory mapping uh, or community-based mapping or citizen science. Uh, there's a whole number of terms uh, that people have uh, framed uh, this kind of discussion around. Um, so, so that's what we're going to be focusing on and how do we use Google Earth Pro to be able to uh, do some of that work. Um, so while we, we're going to give people probably another minute until it's about 1030 and then we'll get started. Uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of information packed in. Yes. So if you click the link, uh, it takes you to our training page, the Participatory Mapping with Google Earth Pro page. And here we've got this, all the slides. So if I go a bit too fast and I've missed something, you, uh, they'll always be here available. You can go back and you can review the materials as you need. Um, I'm, I'm working with Alta here. Uh, she's from South Africa. And I'm working with Cynthia here as, uh, as she's from the Kansas State University. And they're both uh, helping me deliver as well with Rally. Uh, Rally's kind of... Here, <laughs> always. Um, there's a number of resources on this page. So uh, we've got the desktop uh, pro version installation link there. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is we've developed what's called the direct -to digital mapping method. We've got a guidebook. So if you want to download the guidebook, it's, there's a link there. Um, there's a number of other links to indigenous mapping icons, both for uh, the Northern Hemisphere and Amazon, as well as Australia that was recently uh, released probably, what, a few weeks ago? A month ago, um, and uh, and so and then the activities that we're going to uh, be talking about and and doing is uh, some group activities and then some individual mapping. So all the materials are there. So let's just open up the presentation. So thanks for coming. Uh, my name's Steve DeRoy. Uh, I, what do you think participatory mapping is? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you. What do you think participatory mapping is? Yes. Great. Yes. Great. Yes. <laughs> the best thing ever. Yes. Excellent, yes. There was another person over here somewhere. Well, my idea of participatory mapping is all of that. And sometimes we call that community-based mapping. Sometimes we call it citizen science. I heard someone else call it citizen science the other day. Um, but it, um, it's essentially um, how the community defines the approach and the techniques that are going to be used to collect, store, and share information. Um, and it relies on that expert knowledge of the local community. Um, the information that gets collected is culturally, socially, um, environmentally distinct uh, based on uh, an under a long-standing understanding of place. And um, the process of gathering data is driven by what matters most to the community. Um, the output maps may not be in compliance with conventional cartographic standards. So, um, so this is a map of a, a project that I was involved in where we were trying to represent time um, and, and we found that most conventional mapping softwares don't actually effectively do that from an indigenous worldview. So we've got the, the, a calendar of seasons. We've got this time frame of uh, resource activities. We've got the activities that happen at various parts of the year. So we, we were able to represent it in a very, very alternative way than a, a conventional map. Um, and, and, and usually participatory mapping is really an effective uh, approach for community engagement, especially where we're talking about decision-making processes. So um, in more recent years, uh, we developed a, 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 an approach for how we engage with Google Earth. So this is typically how the maps used to be done. So you'd have someone create some custom base maps or you'd use topographic maps of a particular area. You'd figure out the area that you'd be focusing on. Um, you'd then print out these beautiful maps that you'd bring to the community. Uh, you'd roll them out in, onto a big table. This is actually, this is my wife who's actually doing a mapping exercise in, in northern Alberta. 
um, and and you produce basically a crap load of maps. And I don't know how many people have been to an office where they've seen this yeah. box of maps roll, uh, rolled up in the corner or somewhere, and and now it's all that effort is basically has stopped right there, um, or requires someone like myself to go in and put that into a digital format. Um, so in about 20. 12, I think we discovered that the drawing tools in Google Earth were pretty fantastic. We're like, wow, this is pretty incredible. We should be start starting to use Google Earth as our base maps. So when you look at something on the right here, where you've got this conventional topographic map, the same area is this here in Google Earth. And so looking at it, you what you get is a three-dimensional uh, picture of the of the landscape, which is much prettier to look at if you ask me. I, I mean, I can, I can picture the mountains, I can see the places, I can see the beaches. It's pretty easy to, to navigate around. So what we thought was, how do we, how do we put this into a method? How do we actually use this in a way that we can actually apply the map in, in a real uh, tangible way? So what we do is we project the map up onto the wall. We have structured interviews as you, as you would with a paper mapping exercise. We record the audio, the video, and notes, and then we save the maps in a, in a KMZ format. Um, and from there, all of our base map data is collected using Google Earth, um, and then we convert that into a GIS format for analysis. It doesn't require a lot of equipment. It requires a laptop. It requires a projector, a laser pointer, uh, some interview guides, some recording devices, and some power and uh, SD cards. And so these are just some examples of the scenarios and where we're working. Um, when we use Google Earth, we're organizing it using the Places panel on the left-hand side. So we have folders, and we store everyone's data in there, and we have information based on uh, past info. We've got information about the potential project that we're looking at, and we've got other base information such as place names, rivers, lakes, parks, other identifiable features that will help the participant understand the map. Um, and this is an example of a mapping exercise. This is from Brian Tom's UVic Anthropology Student Class Project uh, of, the, of uh, land use and occupancy. Uh, and when you click on the points, you get this really nice uh, dialogue box full of information about that place. Um, same with this, the, the Inu of Quebec Significant Places. Again, you get all these sites along the way. When you click on it, it's got some beautiful photos. We're going to do that today. We're going to add all these features to the map. Um, like Wangan uh, Territory Ethnographic Mapping Project, again, you've got place names, you've got a, a whole folder storage of where information gets held on Google Earth, and you can click on and off those features. And again, uh, the St. Jotham place names by Dave Elliott, um, and this is these are all places uh, according uh, to their, their, their information. Again, it was a student class project, and they've organized it with folders. Um, so directed digital mapping is about using Google Earth. It provides an unparalleled opportunity to get really detailed information of the Earth to then capture really precise and accurate information. Um, uh, that's a lot of information. You can look at the slides. Um, so let's let's talk about Google Earth Basics for directed digital. Well, for one, what is Google Earth Pro? Well, essentially, it's a bunch of pictures that are stitched together for the entire globe that's updated on a pretty regular basis. Um, and it's millions and millions and millions of petadites of information of, uh, of pictures, essentially, real world. And it's not, they're not, you can't go into Google Earth and you can see yourself walking around. It's like a picture, a static image. Um, what we've, we're using today is Google Earth Pro, which is a desktop application. You download it, you can create your own data, you store your own information on your computer. Um, the, the new one that just came out, which we're not going to be talking about today, but I will highlight um, um, that it's a web-based application. Um, there's some minimal creation tools. Uh, it's still kind of being worked through, but uh, eventually this is going to turn into this. Um, so with Google Earth Pro versus Google Earth My Maps, how many people went to the My Maps session? Did anyone go? Okay, so um, the My Maps is a two-dimensional satellite uh, view. It's a, a web-based thing. There's no offline support, and you can. It's really a you know, bird's-eye view. With Google Earth Pro, it allows you to see the three-dimensional terrain and imagery. It allows you to tilt the, the view for a more realistic perspective. It allows you to save data right onto your computer. And there is some uh, offline support. So, but, and one of the differences for those who came yesterday to our My Maps is My Maps is an online collaborative, whereas your desktop version is a desktop version with a physical. Yeah. 
So I, I would, I, I really strongly emphasize that you have to look at the data privacy and ownership issues with Google Earth. Uh, this was uh, based on the, I, I'd say, review the Google terms of reference. Uh, you retain ownership of your content, um, and your Google Earth Pro content is stored locally on your device as a KML file. Um, if you keep your Google Earth data on your laptop for data security, you, there's a potential that you might lose data if your computer crashes. Um, but you can, your KML, depending on who you share it with, once you put it out there, other people might use it. Um, so uh, it's not, it's, there's also, uh, if you email KML files uh, from your email, um, it'll be on a server that may not be more secure than a private uh, file in Google Drive or My Maps. Um, so uh, I, we, we often say keep your data on an external file or, or like a server of some sort, like an external backup device. So tools that handle, can, how many people know what KML file is? Okay, most people. How many don't know what a KML file is? Okay, it's keyhole markup language. It's the language that's used the, uh, in the background. When you add a point, there's all this programming language behind it that says this point is at this particular location with these types of attributes. That's, it's, it's like a, do you know what a word file is? It's exactly like that, but it's the map version of Google. And so uh, inside uh, the Google ecosystem, these are all the various tools in which uh, uh, handles uh, the, the KML files. Um, outside uh, the Google ecosystem, you've got things like ArcGIS, Mapbox, QGIS, Text Editor. Um, you've got K uh, KML to S uh, C I S um, CSV converter. Um, so, so there's both inside and outside the ecosystem. And um, so, what the difference between a KML and a KMZ file is? A KML has all kinds of the informa locational information. If you have photos and and other thing. Um, it creates a big file, so the KMZ is just a zipped version, it's a compressed version of that KML. And so when you send a KMZ file, it stores all the pictures and video and text and everything associated with that, with that particular file in a much smaller format. That's the only difference. It's one, the, think of Z as zipped, like it's compressed. So when we look at imagery in Google Earth, there's a number of different sources of imagery that Google Earth Pro is actually relying upon. Um, one, it's using the satellite imagery, so from the satellites in the, in the, ab above the Earth. Um, it's also using ortho imagery. You can see the imagery where you can see the shadows of the buildings. Um, it's also using three-dimensional imagery, so when you actually zoom down into to the ground, there's a lot of places around the world that it has three-dimensional three buildings. And then there's the street view. When you get right down onto the ground level, what does that look like on the ground? And that's what, what this is. So Google Earth relies on all four of those types of imagery um, to, to then uh, show uh, and, and, and display it. Um, so when we look at imagery, the, how often it gets uh, updated really depends on where you're located. If you're located in San Francisco, how often does it get updated, Rally? Very regularly. <laughs> If you're in uh, where I'm from, which is a place called Ebb and Flow, uh, it gets updated. I think the last update was about almost eight years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, Rockroy. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it really depends on the population and the demand. Now, I've been in situations where I've been like, I've got no imagery, or, uh, or the imagery is really pixelated, like like this picture here. I'll email Rally. She's helping me with, uh, and she can tell you a little bit more about how they do that, but um, they can take individual requests for small areas to then have the Google uh, point to updated imagery uh, depending on availability and other things. So here's an example uh, of uh, what happens. Uh, the imagery is kind of like it's tiled. It's like a bunch of photos stitched together. So this area you can see was updated more recently versus this data that might not have had a had a camera flying over. And then if you look, there's a sliver over here that has a little bit more detailed information. So, so that's, when you get closer to the ground, that's uh, ultimately what you're going to be seeing is, is that. Oh, what did I do? There it goes. So I feel like I've missed a bunch of slides, but let's just keep going. Um, so when we're looking at Google Earth, when you open up Google Earth, this is what you should, should be seeing. You should be seeing a map in the, on the, the main body of the, of the area. You've got this panel along the bottom with a bunch of really nice pictures. Um, there's your search bar uh, at the top. You've got the places panel. You've got um, some, some tools here. And then these are, are pre-installed layers that come with Google Earth. 
And then along the top, you've got a bunch of these tool bars that uh, allow you to uh, manipulate the map. We're going to focus today on this toolbar at the top, uh, maybe some search and, and the layers panel. And then obviously we're gonna be using these tools along the right, which are the navigational tools. Um, if you brought a mouse, it's a lot easier to navigate. Uh, if you don't, I mean, you're gonna, you'll, you'll figure it out as we go <laughs> along. Um, so uh, with the search panel, you can use the search panel on the top left as if you were doing a regular Google search. So you can search for a place, you can search for a name. And what happens as you start to type, it gives you some kind of suggest suggestions for results. And so um, you can use that to, uh, to find places on, on the globe. Um, down here in the layers panel, um, it has a bunch of curated and Google data um, uh, in which the, there's content from uh, Google's partners uh, which they've loaded on here. So there's some really exciting projects that if you wanted to look and get some ideas for what other people are doing, I suggest na navigating through that. Um, the places panel is, for me is the most important area because this is where we store all of our information. This is where we save it all. This is where when you open it up, that's all your information is going to be there. And you'll see on my Google Earth, I've got, I've got a few projects already in there. Um, there's a bunch of pull down menus. What I would suggest is uh, um, it's, it's change, make, making sure that you always show these navigational tools. Sometimes they, they, they as you move around the map, they kind of disappear until you hover your cursor over it and then they reappear. So uh, I tend to say just always have it, uh, have, have it always showing. Again, if you've got a mouse, it's really helpful. Um, there's also keyboard shortcuts, so you can use your arrow keys to navigate around the, around the map. Uh, there's a plus and a negative button, a plus and minus button on your keyboard that can zoom in and zoom out. Um, or you can use the touchpad where you can, you can uh, slide around and, and click and double click. Um, but really the mouse is kind of, uh, it's, it's the one that uh, is my go-to. One of the key buttons on my keyboard is the R button, R for reset. So if you're ever flying around and you get upside down or you're like, you don't know where you are, just press the R for reset and the map goes back to the top view looking down at the globe. I will say that. Um, as we're exploring around the map, and so as you zoom in to the map and go to closer to places, you'll notice along the bottom there's a number of the, these little texts, so like they're... Um, their credits here, but then along the very bottom panel is, is basically the date of the imagery in which you're looking at. And so for the most part, uh, depending on where you are, it'll show you the date of the imagery. Uh, in some places it doesn't, it just uses the conventional, um, probably aerial photo, um, but for the most part uh, you can. And, and in other places you can actually scroll back and, and show historical imagery all the way back to 1969 when, when the imagery first became available. So um, you can see uh, if you press this little clock button in the top panel and, and, and you navigate towards a particular area, it, all these little notches show when the imagery was updated on Google Earth for that particular area. So you can, you can scroll back. I've, I've, I've been in mapping interviews where someone says, I, I don't recognize this. There's too many cup blocks and I did a historical imagery and we can actually see what the landscape looked like prior to the cup blocks being put there. So this, become, this is also a very, very helpful tool for uh, helping navigate. Um, so what we do in Google Earth is we ultimately create a bunch of folders and subfolders. That's how we store our data. That's how we organize it. I really strongly recommend that you uh, create a folder for any new project and put everything into there because uh, you'll want to be able to extract that information and, and find it really easily as well in the future. And to do so, I, I suggest right-clicking on My Places, clicking Add, and then clicking Folder. Um, there's an also a, an edit pull down menu where you can do the same, but uh, when you right click a part in your places panel, it, it, you're intentionally choosing that particular location to store your information. So that's really important. And you can see in this example, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can organize your data. This is uh, from Brian's uh, student uh, mapping projects, all the different subfolders and folders that they created. To, uh, to create categories of information. And with that, once you do that, you can click a button, the checkbox beside a folder, and it shows everything located within that folder at once. So it's really nice uh, to, and, and think about what kind of categories you might create for your mapping projects. So when we're looking at the map, um, for the most part, we're going to be adding place marks, uh, so points on the map. 
Uh, and uh, so the, this is kind of uh, what they look like. You can uh, customize the, the icons that are used um, on there. And uh, you know what I'm going to do? This, let's go back. Let's go to activity one. I think this is a great spot to start. Um, so if we could go to uh, the activity one on the main page. Um, wrong page. There it is. So in this first activity, we're going to create a map of our community. So I've kind of given you a sneak peek of how to do it, but I want you guys to figure it out. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have someone operating the map. Um, who, how many, who's, who's done mapping here before? I'm going to point to Roxroy. Roxroy, come on up here. You, you've done participatory <laughs> mapping. <laughs> So uh, typically in a participatory mapping exercise, we would have one person that's operating the map, which is the mapper. Uh, we'd have one person that's asking questions and kind of keeping notes. And we'd have one person who's actually um, uh, the participant who's sharing their knowledge. So it's usually a three person experience. Uh, but in a group setting, sometimes we have 20 people looking around the map. So Roxy, I'm gonna get you to come on over here. And we're going to open up Google Earth. So here we are. And um, who wants to be our first volunteer? Who wants to uh, come up and use this magical clicker? Yes, I knew you wanted to. There you go, come on up here. <laughs> OK. So actually, you know what you can do is you can actually still sit there at your seat, or you can stand in front of you. Uh, the laser pointer is really strong, um, and what we want to do is we want to map your home and where you live. Okay. So could you help us understand where you live? We live in Washington, D.C. Okay. Roxway, how would you get there? I'll do a search. Uh-huh. And I'll hit search, and hopefully it's take us to D.C. Okay. And where in Washington do you live? Columbia Heights. Could you point on the map for us to show us where Columbia Heights is in relation to what we're looking at on the map? Up in that area? Okay. Do we do we zoom in or do I just you can double click on the map anywhere you want. Is it close? Yeah. Again, Roxroy might need some help with the pointer. So could you show a point on the map for Roxroy? And Roxroy, let, let me double click where the pointer is. Oh, great. Yeah, use your cursor over to move over and double click on the map. Perfect. Is that starting yeah. to look a little bit more like? Should we go a little bit more in? Mm. <laughs> where? Well, we don't need to put it exactly in there. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But somewhere in there. So what is your name? Alexa. Alexa. Nice, nice, to, meet you. nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> Roxy, do you want to add a place mark onto the map? Uh, do you yeah. think that Roxy should make a folder for us? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> How about we create a folder, Roxy? Right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> So to do so, you right click with two fingers on the on the there. So you use two fingers on the there. Two. Yep. And oh. then click add and then folder. And then we can give that a name. Maybe we call it uh, participatory. Yeah. Good. Whatever whatever feels comfortable <laughs> to you. And press OK. And then we're gonna add right click on there, and we're gonna put Alexa's home somewhere in that area. <laughs> Yeah. I do have a mouse. Yeah. I do have a mouse. I've been holding it, but I'm uh, not sure if you're comfortable with no. this mouse. Is she is it on? Uh, oh great. Yeah. So we have um, um I should rename that. That should be um DC Gira. DC girl. <laughs> okay. So now, can you add a folder or add a place mark in that by right-clicking on that folder and clicking Add and Place Mark? 
And when you move, if you just move that dialog box just a little bit out of the way, you'll see that a place mark now has been added to the map. Now, we're not going to put it exactly where your house is, but I think this is. And so what we would normally do in this exercise is we'd probably give it a name, we'd give it a description. If we had some pictures, we could do that. But for now, let's just put uh, maybe Alexa's name, Alexa's house. As the, as the name description. Now when we do this, <laughs> or DC Girls House, uh, and you press OK, what happens is, is that we've got a place mark now, we've got a folder here with DC Girls House on the map. Thanks for being Thank you. a great participant. Yeah. Who else wants to show us where they live? OK. And uh, you want to be our mapper? Ed? We'll switch up some roles here. Thanks, thanks, Rockford. Oh man, he's a, he's a Mac. <laughs> okay. Argentina. Argentina. So okay. let's go to Argentina. Are you going to show us the cats? <laughs> Could you point to the map yeah, and show us on the map where that is? We'll have to zoom in a little bit over there, around there. Okay. Further? Um, Walls? Go up from the back. Out. Okay. Where to? Can you point to the... This, you can put the, the map of the states. The, the different uh, the provinces. Yeah, so if you click okay, on yeah. the borders, mm -hmm. labels, just the little checkbox beside mm -hmm. there. There we are. Does that help? To go further north, north. North, okay. More walls. More walls, okay. Too far. <laughs> yeah. Now you went a little bit too far. A little too, too far. far. Is there okay. a name for the town? Yeah, you want to type it down? Like yeah, maybe sure. we can. Yeah. Villa, Villa, like mm -hmm. V-I-L-L-A. Uh, what else? Uh, no, that, that's it. We have like a hundred options. Okay. Space it. Carlos, C-A-R-R. R-L-O-S, mm -hmm. and then you enter Carlos Paz. There's the first one. Okay. There we go. This is often the, one of the biggest challenges is getting to the place that you actually want to map. So when you're in a participatory mapping exercise, it's, it's all about trying to find the actual place that we're talking about. Uh, so there's Villa Carlos, uh, P.S. Uh, I said, so you have to look mm -hmm. at the map where she's pointing. Mm -hmm. Right? So oh, okay. we zoom into there. So when you do these kind of things, what kind of information you collect with people? It depends on what you're mapping? It depends, but generally there's the who, what, where, when. Um, but then we also collect the why, why is that activity important. Oh, okay. we, uh, we, we collect a number of other things, and we'll talk about that. But predominantly, the, the who is like who the participant is, the what is the activity, the where essentially is the place mark, and the, the, the why is usually in the description in the notes of the information. Oh, there's where else. Yeah. Where? Right, oh, right, should let's we? Go, let's go right in there. Sh should we? we... Let's, you know what? <laughs> yeah. Let's double click on there. OK. <laughs> And Here. Like this one right there? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, just yeah. a picture. She's not waving back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you yeah. can do is Where's if you the... zoom out, okay. there's a little man in the bar, in the right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so if you move your little yeah. cursor up to here, yeah, you'll see that little man. And we, if you drag we just that drop the him map, onto the map, you'll see the blue uh, uh, line. So when those blue lines appear, whoa. what that means is that there's street view imagery in that area. And That's my Adobe house, guys. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Awesome. Okay. So what we can do is we can actually add a place mark here if you'd like. Well, there's an interesting thing here because the, the, the satellite image was from last year, a couple of years before, so we didn't have the roof yet. Now we have the roof, so there's a difference between the street view image and the satellite image. Mm. This is really recent, it's from this year. Yeah, and if you actually look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that the imagery for this is March 2019. 19. Yeah. So is that, is that, did you have the roof? Just before March? Yeah, yeah we did it in February. This February, season. yeah. Probably one of my cats is in there. Yes.
Oh, you need to... <laughs> does that does that help? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, great. So you can see that we we've got a few attributes here that show uh, the age of the imagery, when it was taken. Um, we can we can actually add a place mark. So maybe if we just add to the DC Girl folder, okay. um, we can right click on the DC Girl folder and click Add Place Mark. And what will happen is uh, it puts a place mark in the middle middle of the picture. And uh, now we can add some details. So it's Ro Rocio's, uh, is, how does that how, am I pronouncing Rocio. your name? Rocio? OK. Uh, Rocio's house. Okay. Yeah. yeah. OK. And if you wanted to give the name uh, instead of in the description, oh, okay, okay. what will happen is uh, the, the name will show up as the label, Rocio's house, on the, on the map. Awesome. And press OK. Now, if we exit Street View in the top right hand corner, yeah, now what happens is it goes back in there. It's put the place mark in the center of the screen that we were just looking at. So, um, so we've got two houses here. Well, thanks so much, Ed. Let's give Ed a hand. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rocio. Yes. So you can see um, it takes some time to actually collect data. It, I mean, most of the time, uh, depending on where you're situated, where you're located, uh, depending on the imagery, uh, it, it's, it can be very hard to find places on the map. And most of your time, um, as you're doing the mapping, is like, OK, go left here, go right there, go down here, oh, no, go back the other way. Um, and, and as you're recording it, all of that information gets captured on the, on the on the recordings. But once you get to that place, we would be asking questions like, well, how long have you lived there? How, how long have you lived in that place, Rocio? Uh, a year and a half. A year and a half. Over two years. And you've, been, you've built this house? Yeah. yeah. OK. And this is you and your family? Yep. Um, who else has been helping you build your house? Um, mainly, like, you know, other kind of people that build <laughs> the house. Yeah. 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 OK, good. Yeah. And uh, why did you choose this place? Okay. Yeah. How long have you had that land for then? Seven years, but it was my family. It's your family's land. So this is a connection to you. This place is l long before yeah. you've had this house. Like all of my friends were from this area. Mm. It's like a family gathering place. Is it important to you? Yeah. yeah. Why is that? It's really far away. Actually, it's important, but it's not family because it's really far away from where I work in the city. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I have one movie theater even for the kids who are not buying rent with them. The reason why I was asking Rocio those questions, these are the kind of questions that we would ask. Once we place that point on the map, all of that gets picked up on the audio recording. And, and later on, at the end of our mapping exercise, we will have someone listening to that and typing everything out. So what we do is we'll just have a, a transcript of the interview, um, and later on we would then use Excel. And we just use a spreadsheet. Uh, you can use sheets if you wanted to. Something really simple that's accessible. And we would have a column for quotes. We would have a column for the mapped code that was used. So in this case, we would use Rocio's Adobe House as the code. We have a coding system. Um, we would then also have um, categories in which that that quote describes things. So in this case, we're talking about your house. And other times, we might be talking about a fishing site. Another place, we might be talking about places where people are hunting and another place where people are traveling through. So they each get categorized depending on the type of quote it is. So then what we do is we'll read through all the transcripts. We'll be like, oh, Rocio has a really fantastic description. She just told us about her Adobe house that she's had with her family for the past 20 years that she grew up in this place. This is why it's important to her. Let's add this to the, to the list of quotes. And in that spreadsheet, we would likely have about a thousand quotes that we would then be able to filter if we're talking about, let's say, a beaver, for example. Beaver is my favorite animal. If we, I wanted to hear every single quote about beavers, I'd just click on the filter and say, show me all things about beaver, and then all the quotes about beaver would show up. If we wanted to show everything about people's homes, I'd just click on the, the habitation, and then all the quotes about people's place where they live. So, yes? Absolutely. 
Yeah, so, so to give you a context, I will show you an example of a spreadsheet that we used for a particular project. Now, if I can find it here. Um, the, the map data that we're collecting is in Google Earth, which is the KML file or the KMZ file that we create. Um, the audio, the questions that I'm asking, we have recorders. So we have audio recorders and we have video cameras that are recording the screen. And that's all picking up everything that people are talking about. And then later when we finish all the interviews, we go back and we listen to the audio, we type it all up and we produce a transcript. We then uh, read all, and sometimes these transcripts are 80 to 100 pages long. We'll then pull out bits that we think are really important into a table similar to this. And then we will have ever, all, everyone's quote basically organized. So we're trying to use very basic, very accessible tools. We don't want to create software. We're just trying to make it so that if someone else was to come and use this, they could actually pick it up and be able to uh, um, use it without too much uh, problems. And something like this, when you have a table like this, you can bring it into Sheets. You can bring it into Excel. Um, there's ways in which you can do further analysis. But we're trying to keep it kind of as basic as possible. That's right. And so one of the things that we do is we have a column here called site specific. So in this case, there's a bunch of codes, uh, quotes that are not site specific. They don't have a map point, but they have a very important description about why that value is so important. But in this case, we've got this one right here where the person actually has the quote that's associated to the actual site specific. So we can actually join this table to uh, a C using CSV to, to the actual mapped KML file and then be able to highlight all the mapped values that have quotes associated to them. So then we can actually then do a little bit more detailed analysis. It's really important for the people he worked with to have the privacy of having the data on the laptop rather than in the cloud, which communities can be sensitive about. Since I'm a scientist, we, we don't have quite that sensitivity issue. But you know, it it's really depends on how much do you need the 3D, how much do you need the lockdown privacy, and how much do you want to collaborate. Most of the work I do, we want to put on a website. And since we're going to put it on a website and we want to be collaborative between multiple authors, we would use my maps. Yeah, for me, as, so, as soon as it's onto Google Maps, it's onto Google servers, there's some data privacy issues. With Google Earth Pro, it's stored on my computer like a Microsoft Word file, and I decide when that data becomes public. And it's usually after I've done some post-processing and working of the data that I'm like, okay, this part, of, this fraction of the data can actually be public, but the rest should be private. And so then I decide at that point then to load it onto something like Google Maps or some other mapping tool. So it just gives me that control of. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, I will never put anything unless they tell me to. Yeah, I was just going to add, you basically already said if I was going to add, it's really, I think, about the discussion with the community beforehand and uh, explaining the options of like, storing things in the cloud versus storing things locally and what the implications are and letting them make the decision about which one they're most comfortable with. It's part of that. And I think also what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, just a, a small thing that um, around, it, it, you were talking about the 3D um, sort of nature of it. And in some cases, so for example, we had a project where people were, um, were talking about a place where they were removed from. Um, and they you know, they needed the experience of actually seeing the place sort of as it is in real life to be able to bring out the stories. So that sort of kind of consideration might come into it as well. One more thing. <laughs> so talking about some an event that happened in time, I think another factor is if you need to be able to use historical imagery to facilitate the discussion with the community, then that's only available in Google Earth Desktop and it's not available in Maps. So just to move things along, um, we're going to move to our second activity in a moment, but I'm going to show you a few things before we do that. So the first thing is uh, how we add a placemark. Now, thanks to Ed and Roxway, they've kind of given us a sneak preview on how to do so. Good work, guys. Um, um, but to do so, you, there's a number of ways. You can use the toolbar along the top, or you can right-click on the folder where you want it to be stored, um, and you click Add Placemark. Um, from there, you can give it a name in this name field. Um, you can change the icon, so if, you, if you're not happy with the icon here, if you click there, it gives you a whole suite of different icons you can use. And then you can add a description about that site. 
Um, so here's an example of what that place mark might look like. It'll have a name, the village. It's got a bunch of text here. We've got the point located on the map. It's showing up on our left-hand side here in our places panel. Let's say we want to add some uh, other information or we want to edit or move it. Maybe we put it in the wrong place. If you right click on the, the feature in the places and click uh, get info on a Mac or my properties on a PC, um, what happens is, is that it opens up that dialog box and whenever that dialog box is open, you're now in an editing session. So you can add other text to it, you can change the text, you can move the location. In this case, maybe the village site's in the wrong place and we actually want to move it to another place. Um, so what we can do is just click on it and drag it. Um, and then press OK, and then once the dialog box closes, you're now, you've now completed the editing session. Um, so um, how we add uh, uh, paths, so, so li line work in Google Earth is called a path. And so uh, we might want to use paths for identifying roads, trails, boundaries. Um, so uh, so, so uh, we can easily add by clicking um, either at the top there, there's a little icon with three dots, or if you right click and click add new path. Um, what happens is, is this dialog box opens up but nothing happens. If it's a place mark, the place mark will automatically put it into the center of the screen. Um, but in this case, it's waiting for you to draw it. So what you can use is you can use your cursor and you can click along along the map and just add points all along the way. Or you can click if you're really uh, comfortable with the mouse, you can click and hold the, the, the left key down and just drag your cursor along and it'll draw a whole bunch of nodes. It creates a lot of nodes, but it will do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So so how we would do that is um, so first of all I I'm, I'm going to change the style and color so I can see what I'm looking at. In this case, what I did it, it automatically opens up to the description. If you click on the style and color, you can change the features like the color. I'm going to make it super thick so we can see it on the map. Um, and then uh, I'll show you an example, two examples of how that might look. So uh, path 1 is um, how we click along. So if you just start clicking here and you click here and you click here like this, it depends on the quality of the line that you need, but if you just click along, that's the way it'll look. Now, if you're really savvy, what you can do is you can actually um, hold your mouse down and you can, you can kind of follow along in a more precise way. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of nodes along that route. Um, so if I make a mistake, I, I've got to move all the nodes at once. Uh, it becomes a little bit tricky, but so th that's how you could do. There's two different ways of uh, drawing paths. Um, so so that's how uh, how we can sh uh, visualize that. Now, as you can see, I changed the path color on the first one to be a, a thick red color. When I drew the second path, it retained the same settings of the style from the previous feature. So. If, if this is why I say set your colors that you want uh, up front and then it'll always draw them in that way. So that's how we do a path. Now, to do a, a, a polygon, we would use this button at the top. It looks like a circle or we would add uh, um, what's called a polygon. Now, a polygon is the same thing. Like So we can click along, so I'll call it polygon one. We can click along the map and as you can see, it starts to fill in this color here. Um, now, that's really hard for me to see what's underneath and I'm now lost. So what you can do is change the style and color so that the line work is, I want it to be red as well and I want it to be four points, but then I want the area to be gr a green color. And I can adjust the transparency of that down here just by using this slider and I'm going to make it 50% uh, transparent. So now you can see what we've got is this kind of greenish uh, hue, but you can still see the imagery in the background, um, and we might have some notes notes about this site. So when we've now added that, now when I click on that, we've got the name of the Polygon 1, we've got the notes about this site, and it's, it's stored. Again, with the Polygon along with the path, you can use, if you, if you have a very steady hand, you can easily draw a more kind of I don't know, artistic, let's say, blob <laughs> on the map. 
Uh, so the artist, I'm going to call this an artistic blob. Yeah. So there we go. So I've just shown you three ways in which you can add your place marks. Uh, just so you know, if you wanted to add a bunch of uh, place marks using the custom icons, um, you can use this button in the top right hand corner. And there's a whole suite of, uh, of icons. I generally use this one with the circle right here with the dot in the middle because then I know at the very center of that dot, that's the center of the point that I'm mapping. If you use something like this wine glass, it's very hard to tell which actually is the center part. And actually, to tell you the truth, the wine glass is pretty easy because where the, where the V comes together in the line, that's the center. Um, but something like a bus, if I was to use something like a bus icon, it's it doesn't tell me it show me exactly where the center point is. So if I'm moving something and someone says my this place right here in this location, it's nice to use the little circular uh, icon with a dot in the middle to then put that there. So uh, so I can I can choose that and I can give it a name, place name, and uh, give it a, a blob as the place name. And now when you see I, I've got place name as the icon, when you click on it, blob shows up. So what I'd like to do is, and we're going to spend the next few minutes doing something like this. So I've just kind of gone through uh, these features with you. Um, let's do another exercise. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pair up with someone. So people that are close together, you guys will be a pair. And one person is going to be acting as the mapper and asking questions. And then the other person is going to be the person being interviewed. And they're going to be pointing to places on the map. So we're going to spend about maybe five to seven minutes doing that. Um, I've got a whole bunch of questions uh, that uh, we can use, so like an interview script. Um, but and So what you're going to do in your partnership is one person is going to be asking questions and mapping those values for that person. And then after about six or seven minutes, we'll switch roles. And then the, if you were mapping, now you're going to be the person pointing to places on the map for the other person to map. Yeah, we'll make folders, we'll add text from your interview, tell us why these places are important to you, be as descriptive as possible. If you want to find pictures, if you're savvy enough, you can add photos, uh, but work together to come up with a story. And then at the end of this, what we're going to do is I'm gonna pick on a few people to share their story. So make sure your story's really good. <laughs> so, yeah, no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> So I've got on this page, there's a whole bunch of questions, uh, it's just some sample questions. So uh, so for uh, family and local culture, you might ask questions like, where do your ancestors come from? Where were your grandparents born? Where were your parents born? Uh, where were you and your siblings born? And what place in the world do you identify as your real home? Now, if you want to ask some more generic questions, we've got other questions like, what is your favorite place? Where is your favorite mountain, body of water, whatever the physical feature is? Um, where was your favorite place to play or hide when you were five years old or when you were 10 years old or even when you were 16 years old hiding from your parents? Uh, <laughs> that, that gets a lot of fun, especially in Native communities. Uh, where, <laughs> where, uh, who is the most important, Where, well, who were the most, um, who were the most important animals and plants in your life and where did you, you encounter them? And where did you see some, some of the most interesting, unusual, or otherwise important plant, animal, or uh, species you've ever seen? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick on some people. So, how about you guys? How was your mapping experience? Oh, hi, hi. hi. We're having a fantastic time. Um, I'm learning about Japan. Yeah, it's, what did you learn about Japan? Um, it has cool surfing and um, a really beautiful mountain that has snow sports. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And, and what did you learn, Jen? I, I, I learned uh, Sarah uh, is from Mexico and uh, she has, I mean, cool favorite places in Hawaii. Yeah, that's what I learned. Okay, great. Um, how about you guys? What did you guys learn? We learned that it is quite simple to draw polygons and lines to mark uh, routes between places, so that was quite fun. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was just taking me um, back to our home in Singapore. And we happen to actually know lots of places together in Singapore. So, <laughs> fun. Amazing. <laughs> okay. You guys, how did you guys like working in a group of three? It was great. We got two maps, some okay. beautiful maps. But we were reminded of the importance of saving your map. Because it is not auto saved. Do you even save? Everyone saved their We did now. (laughs) (laughs) How about you? What did you find? Um, It was a great experience. The Hanalei Bay has gentle surf waters. Okay. Awesome. Um, What are some of the things people liked about the mapping experience? Easy? Yeah, easy. Um, What were some of the challenges people faced with mapping? Spelling. <laughs> yes, spelling is always going to be an issue. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? The image? OK. Depending on where you are, the imagery is good. Sometimes it's not. Yes. Same thing. Right. So the whole, the whole idea around uh, what we just did was to give you guys a bit of a a taste of what it's like to actually do a mapping exercise. Um, Now, you know, when we're actually uh, doing these types of interviews, um, they tend to go really fast, and you're mapping a lot of things very quickly. So having a process in which you're collecting information and categorizing it in a consistent manner is really, really important. Now, further on in the slides, um, we've got a whole bunch of best practices for how you should be doing your, your mapping exercises. But so one of the first best practices is to save, and to save often. And uh, so it's nice to hear someone actually said, oh, yeah, we just saved and realized we hadn't saved. So um, my, I'll give you a context of why saving is so important. So I get paid to go to communities to go do this type of research. It means I have to leave home, get on a plane, fly to some other city, get onto another plane, fly to a smaller town, sometimes get on a boat, then travel to the community. And if I get all the way there and I haven't saved my work, it's like the whole trip was a waste of my time. And it was a waste of the community's time. And it was a waste of the participants' time. Because what we're not doing in that situation is that we're not valuing their information as if it's gold, as if it's the most important thing in the world. And so that's why I say save often, save regularly, save at the beginning. Um, there's, we usually have a rule like it's like the save on uh, your laptop, save on a portable hard drive, and if you can, upload it to a remote server so that you have it located in three locations. So, because anything can happen, so you don't want to waste people's time. Um, and uh, Oh, so so there's another thing that we we didn't talk about was adding pictures. So you can quickly uh, add photos to place marks to give it a a really nice context. So if if you have photos on hand uh, or the participant comes with some digital files, it's nice. You can add those pictures to give, uh, to tell that story a little bit more uh, um, in a more kind of visual way. Yes, thank you. There's another thing that we, I won't go too much into too much detail, but that I'll touch on, but you can actually add custom icons uh, to your place marks. Um, And so uh, if you open up the the dialog box uh, in the top right hand corner for the icons, it pulls up this list. But if you go to add custom icon, you can actually, if you have your own icons that you would use, you can download them and then load them into Google Earth and then associate them. Now, here's an example of the University of Victoria has created a whole bunch of icons for participatory mapping uh, for communities in Canada. Um, the link is there on the, on the actual presentation slide. So if you want to go find this and download those, they're, they're, uh, they're free to download. Um, the other, uh, there's an, uh, an, another one uh, that was more recently put out um, uh, in Australia. We uh, hosted an Indigenous mapping workshop, and uh, uh, they actually were creating icons particularly for Indigenous mapping in Australia. So there's a link here at the bottom of this page where uh, you can go to the drive and, and download uh, the, uh, the icons as you, uh, that, that might be relevant to you. Um, 
So how you would do that is you can find the link, you add the, the so the, the icons have to be on a public server. So you, if you have it in your drive, you have to make sure that your drive folder that you put them in is, is anyone can view the link. If you have it so it's locked down that no one can see it, then the icons won't work. So um, the way it works is that you'd click on the icon, you click a uh, custom link, and then you'd uh, paste the, the, the ad web address of that icon into that place. And then you can see there's the there's what it would look like in uh, on onto your map, uh, an icon of a canoe. Um, so one of the things that we often do when we do participatory mapping is we'll set it up in a very distinct process. There's the the pre-interview setup, and then there's the post-interview. Uh, uh, processing. So the pre-interview setup, there's a thing where we want to uh, take some time to understand the study area, the geographic scope, uh, the kind of mapping codes we're going to be using, uh, what kind of interview questions we're going to be asking. We usually have a, a, a guidebook for the, all the list of questions that we'll ask in a very systematic way for each person that's participating. Um, so that's the, the step one. Step two, when we get into Google Earth, we want to get our folders ready. We want to prepare uh, the interview setting. So oftentimes it's about getting you know a table set up with a projector and the laptops and everything laid out nicely, uh, preparing the room. You prepare the participant. You give them free pri prior and informed consent about why you're doing the research. That's really important. You need to get consent before you actually carry out the interview. So we usually have a, a consent form that we ask participants uh, to share their knowledge and here's how that's being gonna, going to be used into the future. Um, then when we actually carry out the interview, we're actually, we follow the interview guide. Uh, there's one lead person who's asking the questions. There's one person who's mapping and then we're documenting the process. So how, what, what I mean by documenting the process is that we, we have a tracking sheet, a, a, what we call a metadata sheet. So for each participant, we'll give them a participant code. We'll have the interview dates. We'll say who was there. We'll talk about what was, what, what was discussed during that interview. Um, and we'll have other things like how many audio files were recorded and how many video files, how many points were mapped in Google Earth. It's a pretty, um, it's, it's just to track the interview. Yes? Absolutely. And, and that's the nice thing about Google Earth. So the question is, is do you let the participants view the information that you're recording? Absolutely. Um, uh, one of the things that we do is we'll, uh, as we're mapping, they're, they're actually seeing what we're actually typing into the dialog boxes. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we're getting is instant verification. They're like, no, that's not what I meant. This is what I meant. Or, no, that wasn't the date. This is the date that we were doing this. Or, no, the, the person's name is spelt this way, not that way that you've put there. So by the time we've got everything about that, each site, the, the participant has verified it along the way. Um, so so we, we make sure that that happens throughout. Yes. Yeah, This is how you can ensure privacy. We, we think about this a lot because for our data, oftentimes they'll go into public databases and they'll harvest it for them and then use it. So we are very careful about how we code things and who has access to the data and the spreadsheets that have to have the code in them. So, so this is this is one of the places in which we can work as a community to ensure privacy. I'm going to give you. An, uh, I'm going to show you a, a folder. I, I can't actually show you the data, but I can show you the folders, the folder structure that we use because it's um, uh, it's pretty comprehensive. When we when we go into a uh, community, we do something like 50 interviews with with that community. We need a, a, an information management structure. So what we usually have is we'll have a folder called interviews, and within that folder, we'll have. Uh, subfolders. So we'll have an audio folder, we'll have a KMZ folder, we'll have a video folder, we'll have the codes and the notes. So we, we try to keep it consistent every single time. Um, so for example, under the KMZ, each person that comes to an interview would have, would have a labeling format. So the, we use a participant ID code as the first, like the first bit, uh, followed by an undercare, um, uh, under... What do you call this? Yes. Uh, followed by their full name, followed by the date of the interview. And we use the same naming convention. So for in this example, you can see we had BO1 was Virginia Absassin, BO2 was Curtis Absassin, and you go down the list all the way down to 
be 50, which was Russell Plassen. And so we can now look at all of their particular individual data. Um, at the same time, you can see we did these interviews in August of 2013. So uh, at the end of, uh, or, and, and sorry, July and August. So um, we started July 20, 22nd, which is here. And at the end of each day, we saved that data for, that, for the data that we collected. And then we went to the next day, we saved all that data. And so we know that at the very last day, which is basically August 19th, that's the, the data with all participants information. So you can see there's a very consistent naming convention that we use for our KMZ files. Um, we use the same convention except we add a 0, 01 or a 0, 02 depending on how many audio files were recorded during that. So we, in the audio files you can see the na same naming convention, but in this case, for example, Henry Itzassen had two recordings. Mary and Mays only had one recording. And so you can see all the audio recordings are, are, are listed in this folder. Um, and then sometimes people participated together. There was multiple people at the interview. Now when we look at the video, uh, we also have the same naming convention as the video files. Just the same naming, but it's a different file format and it's a recording of the mapped interview. When we look at the participant codes, when we were, when, what I was talking about, the tracking sheet that we use, so, so I will show you this one, which is the uh, more up-to-date, August 12th. Uh, oh, just one second. I just updated this. Let me go like this. There we go. Uh, not now. So what we can do is we can actually then look at the spreadsheet of the interviews that took place. So in this case, we've got... Uh, Oh, this is the one I was looking at. Sorry, this one. So we've got the a, a tracking sheet that we can track all the participants' information about the interviews. So later on, when we need to come back and look at, okay, well, who was B13 or who was B01, we have a tracking sheet of the person's participant ID here in this first column, the names as the way they would spell it, whether or not they participated in, the, in, in this particular, in this case, it was the, uh, knowledge and use study of the proposed coastal gasping pipeline project. So we've got all the people that participated. In this case, these people that participated didn't actually do interviews for that. They did it for this other project, which, which was this other socioeconomic study. Um, so we have a very consistent kind of uh, tracking sheet for each, each person that comes to the interview. Um, we've got the dates, the time, who were the interviewers. Um, and, and it's more for us to be able to keep track of um, how they participated in, in which way. Um, we've also got, like I said, what I was talking about earlier, the notes about uh, the participants. So this is a little bit different. So this kind of records not only their the, the, the name of the part person, the PIN number, the name, the researchers, the co-researchers, the dates, the time, the location, whether or not they own a trap line. In this case, it was important for us to understand whether or not they had trap lines. Uh, notes about the interview. So in this case, uh, Alice hasn't traveled to places south of the Peace River. However, she spoke about the places where she traveled as a kid. This is just summarizing what we heard in the interview. So if they, if they said in this case, uh, maybe some person said, "Oh, we didn't. Ha we ran out of time in the interview. It's good to follow up with this person." Or they have a lot of knowledge in this other area. Some knowledge in this particular area. We keep track of that under the note sheet. Um, we have the length of the interview, uh, how many audio and re video recordings, the no where the notes are stored, um, and, and the number of new mapped sites. So at the end of the day, we can then track, and th in this case, 191 new values were mapped with these particular people. So, so that's, that's kind of the tracking sheet. So that's why I say information managed becomes paramount in this process. As a mapper, as a person who's doing the, uh, the data collection and, um, and maintaining all that information, it's more than just a bunch of points on the map. There's a whole other layer to the information management that, uh, that you need to be paying close attention to. And that's why I say back everything up, document the process, organize your data, make sure that if you were to disappear today that someone else could pick it up and continue it on tomorrow. 
And so, um, and understand uh, the data ownership. At the end of the day, all this data belongs to the community. It all goes back to the community. It doesn't belong to me. I have no ownership over it. I have no interest in keeping this data. They've asked me to keep it stored as a temporary, as a, as a backup, but it's, it's not my information. It's the community's knowledge. So just remember that, especially as researchers working in the academic world, know that you, th those are some of the challenges that you're going to be facing in terms of data ownership and privacy. Cynthia. And that's huge. And we're actually developing um, best practices with private lawyers for negotiating data stewardship and ownership and actually having our tribal partners put that into the contractual language when, when they enter these studies. So it's, it's more than just entering into an IRB. It's, it's actually having the language where the community or, or the tribal professionals or you know, whoever you're working with understands the process, which includes things like, can the files be emailed? You know, who has access? Do you sign off? Because for us, a lot of our environmental information with toxic sites and it can be very touchy and very important, and they might want to lock it down. And so we would actually have um, you know, written documents of who had access to the information at different stages. So that's the sort of thing to think about with that data management. That can actually be a really important piece. Mm -hmm. uh, Alta. Sorry, just to add on to that, it might, not, it might also not be a piece that necessarily surfaced in the normal course of action. So, you know, like if you're working with an indigenous community, maybe people are used to thinking about data privacy and those sorts of things, and, you know, it comes up but you may be working in a context where that kind of thinking and who owns the information isn't something that necessarily just comes up and you have to think about it. Absolutely. I'm, I've got about one minute left. I'm, I'm standing in your way of lunch. I do want to touch on another point. It's important to uh, what you do with this data. So uh, like I said, the audio, you want to transcribe it, you want to organize it, the maps that you create. What we end up doing is we randomize the points and buffer them by a kilometer and then, sp and, and then show them in very, very broad categories so that you can't pinpoint what exactly the value is, but you can actually see on a map that there is a value that's been identified by the community there. Um, I, I think the importance of high quality data is, is that uh, it's important to keep your information organized, uh, keeping it safe, and, and making it easy also to retrieve when you actually need it. As you can see, I, I still have that folder. I can go back and I can look at that information. Um, the data can also be used in other purposes. So just because you're participating in a, in a, a, a participatory exercise, think about how that information can be used or not used into the future. So think of all the various ways in which it can. In some cases, you might be using it for managing uh, Crown land referrals. And in some cases, you might be using it for land use planning. In some cases, you might, might use it for educational purposes. All of which needs to be negotiated up front. Yes. Absolutely. And, and at the end of the day, if you have a, a clear method in terms of how you're collecting this information, it can be defensible. Uh, you can go to court, and we have gone to court to defend this information and the method that's been applied. So uh, what I will say before, and I, all of these slides are here, so there's all kinds of notes that we've kind of touched on, but if you want to know more about it, there's a whole bunch here. But um, one of the things you want to think about is all the way various things that you might record at each site. So this is a really important slide. Um, but, and then the other thing is uh, that uh, if you want to uh, cache your data, there's some processes for that. And, and then if you want to the, a more detailed uh, methodology, if you go to firelight.ca, we under our mapping page, we've got the methods uh, that are spelt out. So thanks for coming today. Enjoy your lunch. Have a good one.